get up here, I'd just like to go ahead and thank the Ghetto Hackers over there. They completely owned my ass last night, and uh, if my voice is a little hoarse, it's their fault. Ghetto Hackers rule! Okay, people. Uh, I'm pretty much here to talk to you about OpenSSH. The description on the talk actually said that I was going to talk some about GNU Privacy Guard. Might happen a little, but mostly SSH. Uh, this is not how to crack SSH. Go ask somebody else. Maybe even ask the ghetto hackers. Um, this is SSH on crack. Uh, this is how to get anywhere from anywhere. This is what to do once you get there. And this is finally making it easier to do so. Um, Basic methodology that we're going to talk about today. Step one, get yourself a valid path from the client to the server. Step two, once you have that path, independently encrypt and independently authenticate with your final endpoint. And finally, once you have that link set up, forward services over that end-to-end -end, uh, setup. Now, um, one of the big things that I've done when I've been working on SSH is making it actually usable to do all these things. Very pragmatic law. If it isn't usable, nobody uses it. Now, I'm spending some extra time talking about this because a lot of people here who've ever worked in corporate America have seen really nice, really expensive systems that are a complete useless thing because nobody can figure out how to get them to do anything. And everyone just makes little nice hacks around it, cheats around the system, and management accepts it because at the end of the day, uh, the connections actually work. And uh, business does not exist for security. Business exists to actually make money. Uh, basics, bringing people up to speed. Don't worry, this is not another talk about, ooh, we're going to talk about how to make a link simple local port forward today. We're going to go a little bit beyond that. Uh, but for those, that, for those in the audience who don't fully know about OpenSSH, we're going to start a little from scratch. First, SSH exists to go ahead and forward shells. Just like Telnet, you go in, you go to the host. SSH actually does it a bit better. It clears up a lot of the old issues with regards to uh, spacing with end curses. It clears most of that up. Uh, it also does X if uh, you're actually still using X, which uh, anyway. <sighs> no, um, basically you SSH into a host, X magically works if you have X forwarding set up correctly. Now the reason X is not set up by default anymore is because there's a pretty nasty security hole. Uh, in the X protocol, every character that's sent and everything that's on your screen is actually accessible by the other side. So if you connected to a rooted server, that server will be able to see not just the text that you sent, it would be able to see everything on your screen and every character that you entered. So uh, automatic X support was disabled in uh, modern versions of OpenSSH. Uh, also, OpenSSH allows you to execute single commands on remote hosts and have those appear as if it's local. And finally, OpenSSH forward single ports at a time. Uh, the bullshit geek definition of all this is, quote, all SSH forwards are non-exclusive and non-transparent figments of user space. Ignore that. Uh, SSH under Windows. Um, I know a lot of people don't particularly like Microsoft, but the reality is cross-platform, uh, the ability to use the same solution on every platform, including Win32, is pretty nice. Uh, so there is a package named Sigwin. Uh, that is a Unix prompt on a Windows machine. It is moderately evil, but it is nice. Uh, you name works, VI works. Yes, you can actually control Z out of your commands, and it'll work pretty much. If you're familiar with Unix, you can finally have a useful Unix desktop. Um, the reason I use it primarily is I get an actual SSH client. I don't have to deal with secure CRT. I don't have to deal with 80,000 windows popping up. I actually get a genuine system. This better? <laughs> Thank you for telling me. Uh, if anything else idiotic happens, please notify me. Uh, forwarding shells. Syntax, very simple. SSH, user at host. Encryption is triple dust. Blowfish, AES. Authentication is your standard, either RSA or DSA, or it uses passwords. Key generation is pretty trivial, either for SSH1, do SSH keygen, for SSH2, SSH dash keygen, dash D, uh, TSA, DSA. Um, don't worry, you don't need to try to write all this down. Uh, the slides will be made available on www.docspara.com. But basically, this is how you set up a key so that you can log into a remote machine, and this is how you send that key to the other side. Um, that's what I have set up on this slide. Forwarding commands, SSH user at host, simply 
say ls, simply append at the end of your string the command that you wish to run. Uh, SH is fully 8-bit clean, which basically means that you really can run arbitrary commands and they will fully proxy successfully. Now, uh, this is going to be used later so that we can go into a host and set up links through it using the 8-bit clean functionality. So this is actually extraordinarily useful. Uh, CD burning over SSH, I apologize, I actually can't demonstrate this, but uh, the general idea is uh, the standard command to burn a CD is simply make ISO file system, throw on the Joliet index of names, throw on the Rockridge index of names, pipe that over to the app CD record. Tell CD record how fast you want it to burn, tell CD record the SCSI ID of your machine, and simply tell it, now that you have this information, uh, pick up the... Uh, pick up the ISO image off of standard in, off of uh, standard in. Of course, uh, standard in is being fed by the make ISO file system command. Um, to SSH enable that, all we do is just add in SSH user at host before CD record. All we do is basically change, tell our operating system, instead of running a local CD record, run it over there. The convenient thing now is instead of having 30 machines with 30 burners in them, because you have 30 people who need to use the same thing, uh, there's one machine, it has one burner, and everyone simply sends their files over to it. The encryption comes free, the authentication comes free, it's moderately convenient. Plus the fact that everything works under SIGWIN and works over Windows means you can have all your Windows desktops send files to the one Unix system with a burner. And nicely enough, that machine won't crash like this did earlier. <laughs> uh, file transfer without SCP. I don't know how familiar people are with SCP or SFTP, but they're pretty much both garbage. Neither of them, they rarely work, they get on your nerves. Uh, basically, by executing simple standard Unix commands, cat, ls, tar, tail, maybe even dd, you can go ahead and you can actually implement the in pretty much everything that you would want out of FTP in the SSH framework. Um, I'm planning on implementing all of SFTP using nothing more than these commands. The advantage being, finally fi transferring files using SSH will any host that you can SSH into, you should eventually be able to transfer a file from. No matter what, how much or how little is installed on it, the default software that's enabled will be, will be sufficient. Typo? This is correct. Cookie for you. <laughs> Forwarding ports. Uh, a lot of people get really confused about port forwarding. Uh, SSH user at host. Local forward. Listen on local 8000 to what the other side sees as one two set, the local host port, port 80. Um, you can basically look at the syntax and separate it into listener versus location. Whatever comes first is the listener. It's where the listening port is. It's where new connections come from. If new connections come from my side, it's a local port forward. If new connections happen on the other side, it's a remote port forward. Limitations on port forwards. By default, only systems directly hosting the listener can connect to it. So if I have a local listener on my machine and somebody on my same subnet wants to access it, by default, they can't. Uh, that way, people can't use me as a bouncing off point to whatever host that I happen to be uh, connected to. For example, my mail server or whatnot. Uh, you can make local forwards public by using the dash G option to SSH. But remote ports have to be enabled using uh, gateway ports on the server side. So. I can't go ahead and have my own, uh, so okay, I have a web server on my machine, I want my web server accessible on some other machine. I can make a remote port forward and I can say make remote port 80, eh, make remote port 80 equal to my port 80. But the only machine that's actually going to be able to access that web server forward is going to be uh, the machine that I connected to. Accessing port forwards, there are a couple ways to handle this. First of all, you actually just tell your application, go straight to 127.0.1, or perhaps you go ahead and you go into your host file. So you basically preempt DNS. This is pretty inconvenient, and all, all hosts that you connect to have to share the same IP. They're inflexible. Works for mail, works for SMTP, works for Pop3, works for IMAP. Works if you're connecting to a single web server at a time. You can go ahead and you can have a web server redirected to 127.0.0.1, but it doesn't work too well when you have eight web servers that you want to connect to, or you just want to connect to the web. In general, you don't want to have to say in advance what machine you're trying to get to. Um, furthermore, uh, the port forward methodology completely fails for stuff like FTP. 
Uh, solution, dynamic forwarding. This is an undocumented feature right now in OpenSSH 2.9. Um, dash T 1080, it opens up a SOC server in the SSH client. Um, now, even though the SSH client goes ahead and demands that you in advance say where you want it to go, um, the protocol doesn't. The protocol doesn't care. The protocol says when a TCP session is established, uh, the destination is set at that time. If you have 10 TCP sessions, there are 10 opportunities for a destination to be established. So uh, it'd be really nice, since every single time it could be different, if applications can go and then say, yes, this one time I'm connecting to you, I'd like to be going to CNN. This one time I'm connecting to you, I'd like to be going to PacketStorm. This other time, and so on. Well, SOX is pretty much the simplest possible protocol for doing this. It's a few bytes at the beginning of a TCP session that basically go ahead and say, this is where I actually wanted to go. Now, I don't know how many people here have done SOX programming. SOX programming is so, so ridiculously overcomplicated. You use like library preloads and link stuff in, and usually SOX goes ahead and reduces stability on the client side. It's eight bytes, people. If, if anyone here ever does a SOX client, please just, just write the eight lines of code it takes to implement it. <sighs> Application support. You get Internet Explorer. You get FTP. You get Instant Messengers. You get P2P clients. Napster worked on it when there still was a Napster. Um, Dialpad. Yes, you actually do get some variant of voice over IP over SSH using dynamic forwarding. It's a generic solution to a very wide problem, which is how do you dynamically set up, uh, or how do you support protocols that have dynamic destinations that go to multiple sites? And this is basically the solution. False in the hack, it is not a full VPN solution. Your network is not isolated. You're on the, you're both on the network that you're directly connected to, and you have this link into the foreign net. Um, I may be, I may be connected to, uh, anyway, forget it. <laughs> the big problem is server freeze. Um, SSH is basically implemented with a gigantic select loop. It uh, is not multi-threaded in any shape, way, or form. That's probably a good thing. Makes the internal code very simple to understand, very simple to extend. Uh, the problem is if any single operation inside of the SSH daemon blocks, if any of it freezes waiting for an answer, uh, eh, the entire server process goes just freezes. Now, uh, you can't go ahead and denial a service anyone else this way because SSH forks off other copies of itself. But uh, your own client dies, so if you have one TCP session that causes a freeze, all your other channels, everything else freezes as well. So it's, it's not perfect. OpenSSH is better in this regard. It has less calls that end up going to, uh, it, it, it has less synchronous calls. But uh, the one nice thing is you actually do get some modicum of support all the way back to SSH 1.2.27. Uh, that's been a big goal with a lot of my engineering to actually try to head, go ahead, support the oldest servers in the book. Because let's be honest, the, the old servers are never getting upgraded. Uh, we can't get them upgraded if there's a root compromise in them. How are we going to get them upgraded so there can be new features for users? So uh, any extra features that I've been working on pretty much been on the client side. Make the client do more, but more intelligence in the client because the person doing the upgrading, the person doing the upgrading wants a new feature. They want a new feature. They have a personal reason to go out and get it. Uh, a sysadmin has no personal feature that they want. Or if they do, they still have this whole process of updating something on a production server that's been up for four years, blah, 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 blah. Annoying. Bottom line, upgrading the client, if you can, is usually a better strategy for actually making stuff work. Um, proxy commands. Proxy command is basically the method by which SSH did SOC support. Uh, a proxy command is an arbitrary command that, after it's completed, leads to uh, the S leads to the SSH server in an 8-bit path. So, if you look there, we have a netcat port 22 on some random SSH server. The response is, well, here's your SSH banner: SSH 1.99 open SSH 2.9p1. Um, the idea is you could have some arbitrary tool that does the SOX negotiation, does the whatever negotiation that you have to do, and in the end, gives you SSH 1.9, open SSH 2.9 P1. This way, open SSH doesn't need to care what tool you're using to get to the final destination. It doesn't need to use, care about what protocol. In the end, if it's got its 8-bit path, it'll go through it. Um, well, SSH wants an 8-bit path. Uh, 
SSH provides 8-bit paths. Can we go ahead and use SSH to proxy itself? Um, the, the answer is yes. The correct method to implement to do this is you have the remote side open a port forward to, its, to an SSH daemon and connect it on the client side to standard in and standard out. Now that's the correct method to implement it. I'm not that good of a programmer, believe me. Um, the, I, so I have a cheap hack. I remotely execute netcat. So I remotely execute netcat on a machine that it can actually get to the host that I'm trying to go to. So uh, I SSH into my Bastion host, my one box, my NAT machine. Uh, I SSH into that. And on there, I netcat over to my desktop or to my workstation or whatnot. And I netcat to its SSH daemon. Using netcat based wire mode, ssh o, proxy command, ssh user app proxy, netcat to the correct host, the correct port, and then the username at the server or username at the workstation or whatnot. Uh, this is a mess. This is completely unusable. I'm aware of this. You're aware of this. Everyone's aware of this. So there's a rather simple, much simpler proto uh, syntax under development, which is basically ssh b, proxy, user at server. So ssh b, my one machine that's actually internet accessible, and then some name of a machine behind there. Uh, the encryption actually happens between me on the outside world and uh, my machine inside my network. It does not actually decrypt at the host in the middle. The host in the middle is only being used to provide a network accessible path. Now there's still authentication to the host in the middle. There's still encryption to the host in the middle. So as an administrator, I know that there's a guaranteed amount of cryptography going on. But as the administrator, I lose the ability to go ahead and or I lose the risk of having this one machine that has complete ability to decrypt all communications. Uh, little statistics for you. I uh, went into a uh, very, very large bastion host at a major company, and uh, it had 75, 100 people had SSH into it. They were using it as their bouncing off point to go to their workstations, to go to their desktops or whatnot. Uh, 75 people had SSH into other desktops. 25 people had all logged into other desktops. 10 people had telnetted into other desktops. So here you had one machine, internet accessible, with full decryption, full authentication ability to get into 100 com other computers. Um, proxy authenticates, the proxy decrypts, the proxy internet accessible. The moment this machine gets hacked, and it will someday, that entire network is screwed. Uh, with my solution, that network is not screwed. It was only used as a pathway. It could not actually decrypt or authenticate against any machine that it was used as as a bouncing off point. Um, now, what if there is no internet accessible bastion proxy? You know, now what? What you can do with SSH is you can set up what are known as remote port forwards. I can, we'll just walk through it. My machine on the inside of a network that is firewalled, SSH is out into my machine at home. Sets up a remote port forward, says, hey, machine at home, your port 2022, if you get any communications, listen, send them to me, and I will f feed them to my local 127.0.0.122. Uh, when the client wants to go ahead and connect, it either uses that really hideous command with host key alias, or it just says, uh, SSH user proxies, um, actually, that's wrong. SSH goes in, uh, that should actually say, it goes into itself, Go into your own port uh, 2022 and uh, connect against them. Ah, forget it. <laughs> Bottom line. Okay. Damn you, ghetto hackers. Damn you. No. <laughs> no, seriously. The idea is basically to use the keys as your addressing method. Just go ahead and stop trusting. Uh, The idea is if you can't trust an IP address, you know, oh my god, everyone could spoof this IP, everyone could spoof this, everyone could spoof that. Don't. Connect to any IP you want. If you can see that your, crypto your cryptographic keys said you connected to the right host, you know whether or not you're at your destination or not. Forget the addresses. Connect to any IP. Allow remote port forwards. Allow anything to bounce wherever. In the end, you know whether or not you're connected to the correct host because of the cryptography, not because of the addressing. It actually works. Now, uh, you do actually need to check your host key. You do need to actually check that the remote machine is who they claim to be. Um, you really need to do this when you're forwarding to uh, localhost because SSH will say, you know what, this guy could have 80 connections going through localhost. I'm not going to automatically force a check on host keys to localhost. Um, 
So you either have to use the host key alias or use the new concentrated syntax that I just had trouble explaining, which sucked. <sighs> Two machines. Both of them are firewalled. Both of them are firewalled against each other. Um, usually the way this is resolved is goes up to management. Management fights back and forth. You open a firewall. No, you open a firewall. No, you open a firewall. And it just goes on and on and on. And eventually somebody gives in because they're losing too much money. Whoever loses more money has to go ahead and insecure their network. Um, there's a better way. Both machines go out. Both machines go out to some machine that they can both connect to. One machine sends over its SSH port. The other machine connects to the sent over SSH port. They meet in the middle. They know they're actually talking to each other, again, because of the uh, cryptography. If it works, they talk. If it doesn't work, they don't. So you have some host in the middle. It could be in the middle of a 7-Eleven. It could be in the middle of DEF CON, and it wouldn't matter because in the end the encryption is end to end this host in the middle is only being used as a pathway and nothing more um, escape syntax something that's not known about too much SSH actually has a decent amount of live configuration there's a decent amount that you can do while the SSH client is live um, Hit enter, hit tilde question mark, and you'll actually see that out of your SSH client. And you can go ahead and have it terminate the connection and suspend and list your forwarded connections. A bunch of really useless things. Uh, sometime in the next few weeks, you should be able to pretty much modify any option in the SSH. Uh, basically, anything that you could do at the command line when SSH started, you'll be able to do without having to go ahead, disconnect and reconnect and reauthenticate and redo all of that stuff. SU. Uh, I, I kind of got a laugh out of this. Uh, there's a guy outside who has a car, and his uh, license plate says SU root. Really cool car, really nice car, really, really, really insecure command. SU is not secure because you don't actually ever know you're executing SU. You go ahead, you SSH into some remote host, and you connect as your username, and uh, you see your shell prompt, and it's your user shell prompt, and you ask your shell prompt, please load SU. I want to go ahead and be a different user. I want to upgrade my permissions. How, how, how do you know your shell is actually executing SU? There's absolutely no reason for you to believe that. And in fact, a trivial attack against your bash RC, a trivial attack against anything will go ahead and redirect that SU command elsewhere. Maybe it'll redirect it to a Trojan to SU. Maybe it'll just fail the first time after it gets your password. The bottom line is you can't trust SU after your shell has it. After your shell is run, trojaning an administrator's personal account and just waiting for him to switch to, et switch to uh, root is an absolutely deadly attack. So um, the solution is you have the SSH daemon execute SU for you. Now, when SSH executes commands remotely, it does not load your bash RC. It does not load anything that's personally connected to you. It checks your authentication credentials and then loads the command, period. Which means that because SSHD is usually a root-owned process, you go from local to remote, remote root to, and I'll call in you a second, remote root. The root-owned process never goes through user-level permissions. It goes straight to the user you really want it to be. Uh, there's a new syntax being added, SSH user plus root. So the plus goes ahead and automates that. Now, somebody here thinks that this is wrong or incorrect or whatnot, so I'll oh, go ahead. Um, I believe it actually executes commands through the user's default shell. So if the user's, yes, actually I'm sure of that, which is because that's how uh, people implement SCP only shells. So it doesn't, it doesn't run the command, it runs specifically uh, user shell, dash C, then the command that needs to be added. So if it's been false, dash C command, well, false isn't going to do anything. So the user still doesn't have a shell. Um, your shell, your personal shell is restricted by administrators. You have a file, Etsy shells, in most Unix distributions. It limits what you can select as your own personal shell. So the user can't even go ahead and change shell out of uh, that box that you're making them. Uh, there are uh, problems with this. The big problem is that you have to use root passwords. You have to have 
generally a single root password. Uh, you can't use the public key method. You can use public keys to go ahead and log in as your individual username, but everyone still has to have this root password. This root password almost never changes, so somebody leaves your company, guess what? They still know root on all your servers. Um, one solution to that is individual public keys. You can have a large set of public keys able to log into the same account. Um, if you have everybody who's individually authenticated to use that root account, actually use their own personal key when they leave, you cut their key. Um, are there problems with this? Yes. The primary problem being is if people have root on a server ever, if they really want to, they can never have to leave. Uh, it's called load a kernel module. Um, but it, it, it can be a useful technique. PPTP over SSH. This, this is evil. Uh, but it is a good example of how SSH's arbitrary functionality is rather useful. Uh, PPTP is implemented, let's see how we can do this. Okay, PPTP is a fugly protocol. It is layer two PPP inside of layer three GRE, which transmits layer four TCP, UDP, and ICMP traffic. Uh, it also uses a layer four port, 1731 TCP. Um, I'm sure I could design a worse protocol. Somehow, I don't know. Um, it was created by Microsoft, which We'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> the nice thing about it, though, it is really, really well integrated into Windows. It just works. Um, one of the more painful things, incidentally, about any kind of VPN solution is if Microsoft doesn't write it and you install it, it has a pretty good chance of blowing up your system. Uh, doing any kind of protocol shim in Windows operating system, it either works perfectly or you might as well throw your laptop out. It's one of the two. Um, I lost two laptops to the Nortel client, so I'm allowed to say this. Um, <laughs> so the problem with, with just going entirely with the Microsoft solution is the crypto isn't very good. Um, it's decent. Version 2 is decent. Version 1 was kindergarten crypto. Uh, it was pretty much a good example of every single screw up that you could make. Um, you took the keystream going one way, you exhorted against the keystream going the other way, and uh, there were your keys. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> PPTP version 1 was a mess. Um, but again, it, it, even it had decent network isolation. So you can't, you can't trust PPTP's crypto. It sucks. But you can trust SSH's. So could you go ahead and use PPTP's network isolation along with SSH's trustable crypto? And the answer is you can. Use PopTop. Requires another machine at, the, uh, at your site, uh, real operating system, Unix. Um, sorry for being a little bit of a bigot there. Uh, basically, PopTop goes ahead, implements the listening on 1731 TCP. It implements the GRE encapsulation and decapsulation, but it does not re-implement the PPP protocol. Instead, it just runs the Unix command that does PPP, which is either a PPP daemon, which is a root linking process, or a slurp, which basically was NAT circa 1995. Um, slurp was invented so that you could have just have a shell account. You could run this command, and it would convert everything coming over the line into uh, it would interpret PPP, set up the necessary connections, but not actually do it at a root level, not actually do it at a kernel level, just translate it all into standard system calls that you could do as any user. Um, so either PPPD or Slurp gets executed by PopTop. Who says it needs to be local? Um, you don't necessarily need to... If you're running PPPD or you're running Slurp, why do you need to run it on your own machine? SSH into a remote machine runs Slurp there. So PopTop goes ahead, listens for connections, receives one, says, ah, I now need to parse PPP. Well, how do I do this? I go to that machine on some faraway land, faraway network, and I run slurp over there. And suddenly, my machine on this network is over SSH, network isolated on some completely foreign network. And if I use slurp, I don't even need to be root on that foreign network. Go ahead. Uh, 
Um, that's, ab that's absolutely correct. The TCP stream is only used for the control protocol. The actual data is the PPP encapsulated GRE. So, okay. So, PopTop's sitting on, your, sitting on this helper server. It takes the GRE packets coming out of your Windows machine. It strips the GRE, sees PPP. Takes this PPP, attaches it to a PPP daemon on a remote server. And so it's just, it's just sitting in the middle, connecting things. Uh, this is the really lazy way to go ahead and uh, set this up. Um, it's pre-compiled into PopTop to load Slurp. You rename Slurp to Slurp binary, and just have the actual Slurp command be a shell script to do a remote execution of uh, this command. Now, the reason I actually went ahead and showed you this is, yes, Slurp, uh, PopTop's open source. You can go ahead and modify it. Sometimes you have to deal with apps that aren't open source. Sometimes you have to deal with apps that just go ahead and feel like shelling out every once in a while. Be aware, every time you have an app that shells out to a command, you can, re you can wrap that command with something that executes it remotely and therefore add rudimentary network support to pretty much anything. Uh, one final thing I'll go over, then I'll open to questions. Um, not talking about SSH for a moment. Um, SSH has some problems, just like SSL has problems. Just like those great, nice, uh, custom hardware solutions you see for crypto have problems. They're all link-based. They all decrypt the information as soon as it comes back off the wire. Um, they all decrypt the information using a key that, because it's a link-based crypto, the key's online. The key is uh, a machine that's connected to the network. Um, you have lots and lots of credit card numbers out there that are picked up over SSL and are dumped unencrypted into a database. The encryption is stripped off as soon as it hits this, D this box in the DMZ of some, guy, of some company's network. And uh, then they wonder why they get 300,000 credit card numbers stolen. Well, gee, you didn't encrypt them, and even if you did, you had a key in the same place. It's like I put a key in front of your door, and then I, you know, there's a key in front of your door in the hotel room. Someone goes ahead and says, ah, here's the key. Opens up. But the door was locked. The key was right there. What the do you expect? <laughs> um, File-based systems go ahead, can go ahead and actually separate this out. Um, you go ahead. This is called a lock drop method. You go ahead and you have lots and lots of machines that can go ahead and encrypt data. They have a public key. Public keys let you encrypt. They do not let you decrypt. So you have all your machines that, go ahead, that you want to go ahead and do lots and lots of encryption, because really, encryption is a more common operation than decryption in m a lot of contexts. You want to store lots and lots of credit card numbers for often for a long time. Uh, to actually mass read them, how many legitimate uses are there for mass reading 300,000 credit cards? Uh, emphasis on legitimate. Um, so the idea is basically all your machines that are generating logs, all your machines that are receiving important data, they file encrypt it. The decryption key does not exist on those machines. In fact, ideally, the decryption key does not exist on any network. So if somebody breaks in, they could completely root everything. There's no way to get access to the old data. It's all encrypted, and the decryption key is absolutely nowhere to be found. Now, you can only do this with asymmetric systems. You can only do this with systems based off of uh, something that has a public and private key. If you have something, some pure triple desk where there's, you know, use this Use this string of bits to go ahead and encrypt. Well, the same string of bits used to encrypt, someone just says, great, here's the string of bits. I use it to decrypt. Um, public keys get you around that problem. And uh, we're actually just going to open up to questions. The bottom line that I have with SSH is it's really powerful. It's really flexible. The bottom line with SSH is that it exists as a secure encapsulator of a large amount of functionality. It's traditional insecurity that there's a constant tension between functionality and security. The more functionality you open up, the less secure you're supposed to be. So it's somewhat confusing. Why is SSH successful in what it does? The bottom line is SSH is successful because it implements generic functionality that you don't have to make hacks on to add. Um, best example, SSL upload, uh, upload over an HTTPS server. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, you can go ahead and you can send information using SSL. Uh, SSL will just send anything. It's just a 
stream is just a re-implementation of TCP that is almost accurate. Um, the problem is 99% of the CGI scripts that do HTTP upload are completely rootable. They, they are. They, they suck. And that's because somebody had to go ahead and do use a method that wasn't conveniently made. It wasn't conveniently encapsulated for them. SSH does convenient encapsulation, and that's why it works well. So uh, questions, comments, uh, methods that you wish actually existed to get data from point A to point B? Hit me. Uh, that would be, here, I'll even, docsparrow.com. Backwards paradox. Go ahead. I'd like you to remind people again about section book schemes because practical men in the middle of talking about the hesitation that's coming out. And most hesitations have never learned about the KI or why they need to check what's happening. It's not their fault. It's it's not their fault. If you connect to a machine and it says the host key changed, there are so many situations where the host key actually would have changed that you just say, yeah, okay, I don't care. I don't care that this machine can't prove it's who I think it is. I'm just going to go in anyway because at the end of the day, my job is to actually get into this server. My job is not to scream and shout about, you know, crypto. What does everyone say? They just say, oh, I can't believe it. This machine was broken. You know, hey, admin, you're stupid, but I still went in anyway. That could have been dangerous. No, the uh, the actual I'm actually a solution is being worked on. Um, there's a system called SRP out there, Secure Remote Passwords. It does mutual authentication using passwords. So if the server actually doesn't know my password, SRP doesn't even have, make it need to know password. SRP lets it know just a uh, cryptographic hash of that password. If the server doesn't have any information about me, then I won't be able to successfully log into it. So I get some aspect of something I can remember in my head as opposed to some long fingerprint string but something I can remember in my head, if the server does not know that or does not know anything about it, I won't be able to log into it. Now, if you use that method to authenticate a change in host keys, you eliminate 99% of the uh, issues where, uh, where someone will just automatically replace a host key. It's like, yeah, you're connecting to some machine, and not only does it have the wrong cryptographic information, it doesn't know your password. Yeah, I'm going away now. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Uh, go to Fresh Meat, search for SCP only. It replace your user shell with SCP only. All that we'll be able to do is execute the SCP command. Uh, Secure ID has specific support for it in a unsupported patch. It's in the contrib directory. Go ahead and compile it. Uh, it may even be a configure option. Um, generic, fun generic functionality is being added to make it easier to do stuff like Secure ID, to do stuff like Crypto Card and whatnot. So uh, that's that's been a big issue. A lot of places with cust with custom authentication methods. So that should be up and running soon. But uh, Secure ID is specifically supported. Go ahead, right there. Granted. First of all, what's the, uh, what would be the negative drawbacks of using pseudo instead of SU? So that you control the passwords How do you know someone's executing pseudo? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same thing. As soon as you lower your permissions to that of a user, as soon as you're dependent upon user permission code, you're done. You can't upgrade backup successfully. It's a basic precept of security. Pseudo limits the damage that somebody can do. But the bottom line is, you have a pseudo command that only an admin can execute. Um, you want there to be a difference between your user account and your admin account. If you give your user account extra features, then what's the difference about having? Basically, you need there to be that separation between user and root. If it's not there, a lot of, a lot of Unix permission stuff breaks. And uh, you can't get around that. What was your other question? Um, yeah, artist over SSH. Or rsync, excuse me. Uh, 
um, use restricted shells like the SCP only shell uh, and uh, distribute host distribute host keys. Um, email about, email uh, email me about this later. We'll see if we can come up with a generic solution to it. Go ahead. Uh, fast, no. <laughs> Cryptogra cryptographic hardware accelerators, I believe, actually will work with OpenSSH because OpenSSH gets most of its crypto out of OpenSSL. Uh, I haven't verified that. In general, though, CPUs are getting pretty fast. Uh, the OpenBSD team just got, what was it, uh, 2.5 megabit per second tripled S using 1% of a mid-grade Pentium 3. So, you know, extrapolate that out, you get about 250 megabit. Uh, perfect, no. Fast, faster than you're probably going to need for anything but uh, full wireline crypto. Yeah, uh, that'll work. Oh, incidentally, you have all these VPN vendors bragging, yeah, we've got something that you can terminate 60,000 connections against. Great, so you have one machine that if I break that machine, it has decrypted information for 60,000 hosts. Great. Uh, the nice thing about my solution is, yes, you have pathways to 60,000 other hosts, but you don't have any of the data that went through it, and you don't have any of the authentication methods through it. Go ahead. This, this, is, this is the hardware dream. This is the dream that if you put the key really, really, really deep into your hardware, nobody will ever get access to it. And I, I think the perfect rebuttal is anything that has anything to do with DirecTV. Anything? <laughs> the, the bottom line, okay, the bottom line is, um, yes, storing something very deep in hardware can be useful, but in the end, that keying material needs to be accessible to the outside world or else what's it matter? It's great, you have, a key, you have a set of bits that can't be accessed. And by circumventing the method by which uh, the legitimate bits are read off or the legitimate bits are worked through, by circumventing that and using it in a context that a company didn't expect, uh, you often can receive the same, uh, the same utility. Anyone else? Back there in the white. Um, I really should have gone into this during this talk. Uh, there is a wonderful app out there called MindTerm. It is a full SSH implementation written in Java. Um, somebody has gone ahead and added SCP support to MindTerm. So uh, it'll go ahead and actually gives you a decent interface over SSH to throw up files. Um, User goes to a web page, it loads a Java app, the security of the Java app is actually verified by, the, by code signing, and uh, you use that to go ahead and upload your files. That's worked pretty well. What? Is networks. Is networks. Go ahead. Curb's one of those things that I know, I know deep inside it's good. I know deep inside it's secure. But just the whole concept of one machine that if it's penetrated, everything dies, just really seems to bleed single point of failure to me. So I, I have issues with it personally. Um, other people use it very successfully. Other people use it in very large scale deployments. Uh, so SSH has quite a bit of code in it to make that feasible. Personally, I have issues with the entire, with some of the Curbs philosophy. But SSH itself does support what you're referring to. Go ahead. Nobody should, but okay. Would you rather do SSH1 or would you rather do Telnet? Um, one, one little political statement, um, ssh.com, why guys, why did you bungle the ssh1 to ssh2 migration? If, if you ever do anything to do with migration, please, for the love of God, be backwards compatible. 
and be upwards compatible if possible. Um, what basically happened was this. SSH.com comes out with SSH2, a complete re-implementation with no new features. Good job, guys. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the entire thing was implemented. The entire SSH2 protocol was implemented in the SSH1 framework. You can't do that unless you have no new features. It, it physically doesn't, it, it, code doesn't happen. But uh, they basically set it up so if you upgraded your servers to SSH2, suddenly all your SSH1 clients started screaming at you. If you upgraded your SSH1 clients to SSH2, suddenly you couldn't connect anywhere. So uh, you, you had this catch-22 situation, and it, what ended up happening is was nobody ended up upgrading to SSH2. Um, OpenSSH comes out, does nice, convenient migration path from uh, SSH1 to SSH2 by simply supporting both well. And uh, it's not the freeness. The freeness of OpenSSH is nice. But the reason people used OpenSSH, the people, the reason OpenSSH was migrated to over the SSH2 server was because was because it didn't break everything. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the Cisco routers don't support SSH2. It's a, it's it, it's amazing they support SSH1 at all. Um, they barely got that going. So, um, but yeah, the reason why there is concern about the SSH1 protocol is because there are these issues in it that do look like sooner or later are going to lead to compromise. Um, there's, huh? There's no out-of-the-box penetration of an existing stream. The best you can do, there, there's been some interesting work uh, determining someone's password by the amount of time it takes between uh, packets when they hit the keys. Uh, Edder cap, what's it do? I, I mean, I know it's another sniffer, but does it have a special SSH mode to it? Yeah, exactly. It, it in the middle and uh, does something with uh, doesn't keep the key. This, it sounds like it's doing the, uh, it, it's, it sounds like what you're saying is that it's doing the host key spoofing and waiting for the user to just say, I don't care, I want to get into this host even though the host keys don't match. Uh, SSH2 is going to be vulnerable to that too. Um, in fact, about the only really good solution to that is to have SRP support and to use the password to authenticate a change in host keys. Well, I mean, seriously, if, I mean, SSH1 or SSH2, if your host key doesn't match and you accept it anyway, you're screwed. Hmm. I'll check it out. Uh, send me an email about it as well. Anyone else? Well, in that case, it's been a blast.